This house that we're in is, uh, is where I live. It's uh, also where I work. I bought it in 1996, where it was originally advertised for rent. I was lucky to be able to persuade the owners to sell it. Uh, it was a um, derelict warehouse, which had been used as a part of a dry cleaning company. And um, it really was a mess. There was a lot of work needed doing. For several years, up, to, up until the year 2000, I used it as a, to gradually convert it into, into a studio and, and, that, and started doing sculpture there. Really, the first time I'd had an opportunity to work on, on, a, on reasonable scales. I'd never ever had a large enough workspace before. In the year 2000, I applied for planning permission to convert into a house and um, the whole project took two years. I had help with the um, early stages, with underpinning and with a new roof and with some, some concreting, heavy stuff. The rest I, I did myself and, and treated it really as a creative project. <laughs> Exhibition Ripon was very important to me. It was basically the first exhibition one-man show I've ever had, apart from a small thing years ago in, in Grimsby. And um, I would think 90%, 95% of the work has never been shown, never been outside my house. So it was interesting for me to see everything together and to um, try and figure out whether I could see development. <laughs> In the fifth form at grammar school, I uh, enjoyed art. I was always drawing painting at home. But the headmaster of the school was, uh, and um, other staff were very keen, I think at the time, that I went to do maths and geography in the sixth form. I decided not to do that and um, chose to go to art school. Grimsley School of Art, where I did uh, what would then was called the intermediate course two years and um, after that I gained admission to the Slade School. I'm very pleased to say that my, both my mother and father were very supportive. Neither had any real sort of knowledge or interest in art. My dad was an engineer and um, but yes they were very keen really for me to go ahead and do something that I felt I wanted to do. I went there officially on a three-year course having completed the, the intermediate two years and um, spent um, virtually all the first year drawing. In fact, the first term I spent in what was then the antique room, an amazing room with um, plants, casts everywhere, animals in cages, uh, birds in cages, enormous amount to draw. I spent the first year drawing. It was a four-year course then. I think I was ex exempt from, from one of those four years, having done the intermediate course. I, I was ready to, ready to go home at the end of the last term. I went to the traditional st uh, strawberry tea and to the prize giving, and um, very surprised when I, was, I actually won the life drawing prize, and even more surprised when I was asked to take in my folder 
following morning with a view to it being looked at again, after which I was offered a postgraduate year, which I did in, uh, in stage design. Oh, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I think in some ways that um, probably where my interest in, in three-dimensional work probably started because, you know, we had to do models, scale models for the, for the stage sets. And uh, of course, yeah, it, it, it involved reading plays. It also could easily involve music for operas, for ballet. And um, so for me, uh, being especially, I think, a, a provincial student, uh, where majority of students at the Slade in those days were certainly from the home counties, um, I, it introduced me to a lot of the of the arts, really. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that, and I was pleased to um, to win the theatre prize at the end of that year. And and also, I was on the Arts Council Index of Designers, and and uh, was offered some jobs in theatre, but decided not to do that. I was offered part time work at the school that I'd been a student at. Uh, there'd been a change of head of department. Um, and uh, the school was actually becoming something bigger because it had been very small when I'd been a student. I think there were just five of us in the first year and two in the second year. And I came back, did the, for I think it was around about two terms, teaching uh, part-time. And the hours were built up. I was offered more time and uh, eventually I was asked to become full-time. I was asked that it was the first time to, t to teach some three-dimensional work. I had to uh, clue up on techniques, mould making, casting. Uh, so I, I needed to be ahead of the students, although I was only roughly four years older than some of them. Uh, so I, that's really when I started doing sculpture. I was mostly teaching life drawing. I started really with uh, clay modelling and um, uh, plaster mould making and casting in plaster cement fondue and then I, I uh, discovered cold casting that is in um, polyester resins with uh, metal as a fine fine metal a ground metal as a filler in the gel coat um, hated the material I think it's totally unsympathetic and very smelly and sticky and just didn't like it uh, so I, I then started to weld um, first of all, with steel, a piece of steel, and um, did quite a few pieces, including some abstract pieces at the time. These, we're talking about, um, when would this be, the early 60s. And it was only, I think, towards the end of the 60s when I, I really got became interested in using copper, which, once I'd got the hang of welding it, I, I liked the look of it better, I liked the colour. And uh, it, in, in a way, gave me a chance to end up with shapes that uh, rather rather similar to bronze casting. I mean, I never was really able to afford any any bronze casting, and this. But of course, these are one-offs. All my works are, you know, one-off piece. Sculpture. One of the exhibitions that I saw that really had a big impact on me was when I hitchhiked to Venice. Um, just can't remember the date, but it would be early 60s, and saw sculptures by Marino Marini. Uh, he became a firm favourite, and still is in many ways. Uh, I, I also started looking at um, other Italian sculptors, Giacomo Manzio I liked very much. Um, of course I liked Epstein. Um, as an English sculptor I, I discovered Ralph Brown, who I was quite influenced by, especially when I did um, quite a large, my first large commission. I met an architect somewhere around about 1968, I think, uh, and um, he'd, he'd, he'd seen my work. I had, I had some work in a group exhibition to a small uh, museum in Grimsby, which is actually a, a sort of museum at the time called the Doughty Museum that had uh, trawlers and fishing craft models on. And I had some work in there. And I think, he saw, I think he saw my work there and asked if I would be interested in doing um, a large commission, which, considering it was my first one, was, was really rather large. And it um, was for a side of a new shopping precinct in Immingham. And it was a family group, mother, father, two children, all rather, rather blurred. Um, got a lot, of, a lot of controversy about it. Um, my mother kept all the 
letters that people wrote in complaining about it because I suppose technically these figures were naked not that you I mean, the detail was all, all very sort of um, amorphous I think would be the right word however there you know something for them to complain about <laughs> I've done quite a few quite often with the same architect churches in Newark in um, Bingham Nottinghamshire several in the Grimsby area including the parish church uh, St James and smaller ones as well with him as well I did a very large uh, piece to do with the Viking le legend of Havelock the Dane and Grim the fisherman from where Grimsby is uh, named and that is still on the side wall of a supermarket actually very close to the Grimsby Town Station, so as you come out of the station, you more or less can't avoid it. Hello. Ah, hello. Hi, nice how to are see you. you. Yeah, and you, how are you? Well, Harold has, has been working away for, for many years, um, but he's never really wanted to, to show them. But, but I think more recently, particularly when he created these huge life-size horses, these riders, um, lots of people started to actually encourage him be because I think we all felt that, that they deserved to be seen by a much bigger audience. So. We, we encouraged him to, to exhibit them, um, and this is how they've, they've come to be here in Ripon Cathedral. So here we are with the, the two life-size riders on horseback. Mm. Um, so the wooden maquettes and, and the copper finished work. Yeah, well, the, yeah, the wooden one, uh, as I said, is, is really a, a former, a mould. And it's hollow and it's made from um, builders, straightforward builder's timber, uh, all glued together and then carved. Mm. And it's in about 15 or so pieces, so I can um, take it take it apart and reassemble it, which is what I did to to bring it here. The technique I used for this was, as in some of the smaller ones, was to take pieces of copper and um, anneal them, that is, soften them with heat, and then beat them round bit by bit mm. round the actual original, and uh, eventually join all those pieces together by rivets. I'm working in, um, when I'm working in copper on a small scale, and uh, if you use this as an example of um, a, a rook tried recently, a relatively um, simplified version, almost, um, I hope, an essence of a, of a rook, uh, I, I start actually with drawings. And here are just two of, I mean, I like to know the um, structural shape, and I, I like to understand the, how the skeleton works and of course I'm obviously some sort of silhouette shape that I'm aiming for. Then I would do uh, a clay model and this would be a typical example. In this case very simplified because I'm hoping that the final um, copper shapes will contribute to the uh, essence of the sculpture later. And so I would make a plaster model of this. Now in this this one that I was doing, obviously from a slightly different clay model, I ended up with a two-piece mould, two pieces of plaster, and my plan in this case was to add the beak, the tail and the legs up separately. But do need some sort of uh, shape in which to place pieces of copper. I mean, you can't just start joining them in mid-air. So I would um, cut pieces of, um, in this case, relatively uh, thin uh, copper and um, first of all I, had to, I would have to anneal them. This would be what, roughly what copper looks like to start with. This would be once it's annealed uh, with heat. 
and then I could um, cut cut shapes out either pre-planned or in some cases fairly um, sort of haphazard and then and then join them and I would join them by using oxycetylene welding equipment and uh, copper welding rod So Harold, there's another group of horses here yeah. um, and the one in the middle, the, the horse torso, is particularly interesting because because of the perforations in it. The gaps in it, yeah. Well, my <coughs> idea about this was that I, I feel that if um, the, the drawing or the, the forms are as subtle and as well seen as possible, then it doesn't really matter how many gaps there are because the viewer can piece it together. And so I was very conscious that the um, rhythms going from one area of the horse to the next had to be as accurate as I could get them, even, mm. even if there are big gaps there as well. How, how do you decide where to make the gaps? Is it, is it just natural because of the, the material or, or do you make that decision afterwards? Again, it depends on the technique. So again, there are two, these two techniques I briefly mentioned. This one was over wood. This, these ones were over uh, into a mould. Mm. Over wood, I could draw on the, on the wood and decide there where I wanted to actually create shapes yeah. and fix um, small pieces of copper. Technically, you have to anneal them, make them softer, beat them and so on. And I could build up a composition of shapes and spaces over the wood. So Harold, is this you? It, well, it was me about 15 years ago, <laughs> yes. Uh, considerably younger, yes. And have you done many self-portraits? Very few, no. It's, I found it very, very difficult. Um, yeah. Anyway, one's enough, in my <laughs> opinion. <laughs> For a, for a few years now and a year or two ago your Art Gallery acquired a work by him so it's fantastic to be able to see the range of his practice um, and also the development so how he's worked in wood in copper in different materials and really experimented with different techniques I think it's great to be able to see that all together and of course to also be able to see his work in process so so here you can see the preparatory drawings maquettes the finished work so it gives a really great overview of, of the process of, of Harold's work as an artist. It's a huge privilege to be uh, able to display work in such a beautiful building. I think the, you know, the wall textures, the colours, um, sort of the whole atmosphere is perfect for for sculpture, I think. Thank you. 